historic estate. He passed away in 1955, uh, did not have heirs, so he um, donated all of his very considerable wealth to establish what is now the Robert R. McCormick Foundation in Chicago. That's our parent organization. It's a major philanthropy and does $50 million worth of charitable grants a year uh, for Chicagoland and around the country. Uh, he also said uh, that Cantini, his estate, should become a public park for the people of Illinois. So if you're here from Indiana or Wisconsin or any of those places, you're our very special guests. <laughs> uh, and we're just as happy to have you here as we are the people of Illinois. Uh, Cantini, for those of you who are familiar with the history of the 1st Infantry Division, you'll recognize Cantini as uh, the place in France where the 1st Division fought its first battle ever in May of 1918, which was also America's first battle for Europe uh, it was the first American battle of World War I. Uh, Colonel McCormick served there as a volunteer citizen soldier. Uh, he volunteered for military service when he was well in his 30s. Had already been a Chicago City Alderman, a, wa a law partner, uh, and was, was the president of the Chicago Tribune Company. And he could have let military service pass, and nobody would have been the wiser. But he said, my country's at war, send me. Uh, they sent him to Paris, uh, gave him a desk job, and he said, no, 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 send me to the front. Uh, they retrained him as an artillery officer, and he commanded the 1st Battalion, 5th Field Artillery, 1st Division. He fought at Cantini, served for the rest of the war, was promoted to colonel, came back, and never forgot his fellow veterans and those with whom he had served. He was one of the founders of the Society of the 1st Division. He hosted reunions of the 1st Division here all through the 30s and 40s. Uh, he founded American Legion posts, and he was absolutely devoted to service members and veterans for the rest of his life. So we carry, that's why there's a First Division Museum uh, at Cantini. The Colonel pays all of our bills, and we do pretty much what the Colonel left in his will for us to do. So it's in that vein that we offer this series of lectures. Uh, lectures is the wrong word, series of evening talks, which we're delighted to have you here for this evening. Uh, they're on a variety of topics that have to do with American military affairs, most of them loosely or tightly tied to the history of the 1st Infantry Division. This one is tightly tied to the history of the 1st Infantry Division. Uh, and we do that because we're a democracy. And uh, it's we the people. Our Constitution says uh, that are for the common defense. That's why we have one of the purposes of the Constitution. So ultimately, uh, whether or not we go to war, and who our soldiers are and what they experience is our responsibility. They don't belong to the Pentagon. They don't belong to the White House. They don't belong to the brass. They don't belong to the generals. They belong to, I was about to say we the people, but I know I have English professors, so it's they belong to us the people. <laughs> uh, and so we think uh, the people of a democracy should be well informed about military affairs. And so that's why we do what we do. So tonight, we are absolutely delighted to have Colonel Retired Bill uh, Haponsky here, and he has brought an entire cast, supporting cast, of uh, great former soldiers and veterans of the 1st Squadron, 4th Cavalry, 1st Infantry Division, which Bill commanded for six months in 1969. Uh, he has written this memoir, Dangerous Dragoons. I uh, started on it years ago. I'll let him uh, tell you about that. Uh, but we were delighted to publish it, which we have, because it is a rare, rare, rare piece. Very few of the tactical and operational level commanders who served in Vietnam wrote about it in the aftermath, but Bill did. And he, it's not just a personal memoir or even mostly a personal memoir. He has worked for years to get the history right, to include the soldier's view of what they were experiencing uh, and to give us, the readers, some sense of what that squadron, how that squadron operated and what it experienced uh, for those six months that he commanded it in Vietnam. Uh, Bill is a West Point graduate. Uh, he taught at West Point on the faculty, uh, an English um, uh, instructor at West Point. He's gone on to many other accomplishments uh, in his, both in his military career and his civilian life uh, afterwards. He was a distinguished uh, soldier uh, who served the 1st Division in the United States very, very well. Uh, we'll let him introduce all of his uh, uh, fellow 
Quarter Cav uh, vets who are here tonight a little later on, but I do want to recognize his lovely wife, Sandra, who's here in the second row, who also endured the years and months that he's going to tell you about, and we often skip over the fact that our spouses and families also served in their own way, while those of us who have served we're away doing our country's bidding. So Sandra, you're very welcome here tonight. We appreciate your service. So without further ado, I am delighted to introduce Colonel Bill Hoponsky. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And if you want to know who the real boss is for 58 years, there she sits right there. <laughs> Paul, thank, thank you so much. Am I coming through okay on the mic? Okay, good. Uh, thanks for asking me to do this book. Uh, I wanted to do it especially for my guys, and uh, it's a real honor to have been uh, selected to do just that. Let's start with the title, Dangers Dragoons, the Armored Cavalry Task Force of the Big, Big Red One in Vietnam, 1969. Now, one thing that I should say right away is that although this book was written about 1969, uh, basically, it also includes the uh, experiences of all of the task forces from 1965 to 1970. So uh, it, it has some of the highlights in there. So uh, I hope that there are some of you out here who are from those other years. I'm going to speak for only 30 minutes. And then we're going to have question and answer. I've always felt that that's the most in interesting part of it. Okay, dangers, dragoons. Danger, why danger? Because danger was the call sign, the uh, radio and the telephone call sign of the 1st Infantry Division in w World War II. And they've kept that uh, ever since then. The 1st Infantry Division's big red one is known as danger. Dragoons, where did that come from? Probably from a 15th century French firearm, Le Dragon which uh, was carried by, actually, by mounted infantry, not the cavalry. But the cavalry picked up the term. And today, throughout the world, you're going to find, uh, you, you would find if you went up on the internet, that several countries in the world have cavalry outfits, which are called dragoons. I was dragoon six, the commander. Uh, what was the Big Red One's Armored Cavalry Task Force? And what was the uh, cavalry squadron at the core of it? You'll get some of that uh, uh, tonight, and you'll certainly get it in the book. The book is going to answer those questions in terms of several things, such as the uh, organization, the equipment, and the uh, employment of the uh, squadron and of the task force. But more importantly, it's going to answer it in terms of men, ours and the enemy, courageous fighters all. So let's start with our men. Here's the dedication. This book is dedicated to the magnificent troopers and soldiers of Task Force Corps de Cav, especially those who did not return with the rest of us, or who were grievously wounded, or who became emotionally or physically ill from Vietnam service. And to their families and loved ones, thank you. We were and remain a band of brothers. I'm going to illustrate the kind of men that I had by reading short excerpts from the book. I'd been the senior staff officer of the 11th Armored Cav Regiment uh, before coming to the Quarter Cav, which was located in Xi'an in uh, uh, January of 1969. Here's an excerpt relative to the pacification mission that we were undergoing at that time. A bright and shining spot of our pacification effort was the S-5, Civil Affairs Area. I had come from 11th Cab thinking I would never see the equal of its S-5, Captain Lee Fulmer. I was wrong. Captain Tom Witter, a Pennsylvania National Guard officer, matched Lee in zeal and competence. There was nothing Tom would not try in order to make life better for the Vietnamese. He programmed all civic action and taking great risks was out many nights working in the hamlets. Driving those roads at night was hairy, but Tom and his two helpers did it routinely. Tom and I spent a lot of time together on our pacification projects, and I thought that if we both made it through the war, we might become good friends. We did. 
Tom Witter. Please stand. This is a unique book. It interweaves the enemy's uh, actions with those of our actions. These are the actual enemy that we fought, and it's faithful to the chronology of those actions right down to the minute, minutes. And I know of no other book that actually does this. My major sources were my uh, a journal that I kept in Vietnam and input from these guys and many, many others. About 14 years worth of input, as a matter of fact, many, many face-to-face uh, -face meetings, but a ton and a ton and ton and ton of uh, emails that we sent back and forth. Also, the research team that we formed right in the beginning kept, uh, copied 15,000 pages from the National Archives. Now, these were the records of our combat unit and the records of the higher uh, headquarters and some of the adjacent and other support units. <laughs> and all of it related to our actions. In, in addition, in 2005 and 2010, I made visits uh, back to Vietnam to the battlefields to study them and to talk with our former enemy. I found uh, some of them and with some of our former South Vietnamese friends. I'm going to give you the uh, sources for the enemy information shortly. First of all, the CAV Squadron organization. The CAV Squadron was a battalion size unit with a lieutenant colonel commanding it. We had a headquarters and headquarters troop and three line troops, A, B, and C. And each of those uh, troops had three platoons. And the platoon was the basic fighting unit of the squadron. It uh, contained three tanks and seven A cavs, armored cavalry assault vehicles. Well, what were they? They were armored personnel carriers uh, modified with two extra machine guns, one on each side. We had over 100 armored vehicles in the squadron. We also had air troop, uh, air cab troop D, uh, D troop air, but I had it only for 11 days in, in my command for reasons that are explained in the book. Here's an excerpt though that relates to our air cab troop. When I first met Hugh Mills, I came away profoundly sorry that division was pulling our air cavalry D troop out of the squadron and placing it in the 1st Aviation Battalion, an utterly confounding move, a precious combat asset placed under control of what was primarily a support unit. Hugh was just the kind of high-spirited young aviator who would make a superb combat leader, and I wanted him and the others to be part of my unit as the armor, Army had intended. They never intended for it to, to be taken out of the squadron. Hugh volunteered for the highly dangerous Aero Scouts of the troop, because he viewed them as the baddest of the bad, and he wanted to be a part of that hair-raising experience. He was very young, barely 20, to be a first lieutenant and headed for such responsibility, but he, keep, he became a highly decorated scout pilot and platoon leader of D Troop's Aero Scout Platoon. Now, although the Air Cab Troop was taken away from me, actually I had it under my operational control many times, or at least major portions of it. Uh, they, these uh, Aero Scouts were something else. They flew at treetop level and below, and th that's the, absolutely the most dangerous place that they could have possibly been. And so it turned out that the Aero uh, Scouts and the Air Cab, uh, Air Cab's uh, rifle platoon, the Aero Rifle Platoon, were the most shot at guys in the division. Listen to this. Hugh Mills received 20 U.S. medals for valor to include three silver stars, the third highest uh, award in the American Army, plus three South Vietnamese medals for valor, and three Purple Hearts. Uh, he might say that he was an overachiever. <laughs> in fact, when he came back, uh, he wrote a fantastic book that I would highly recommend to all of you called Low Level Hell, A Scout Pilot in the Big Red One. It's a wonderful book. Hugh Mills, please stand. <laughs> we never fought as a pure cav squadron, always as a task force. In other words, we cross reinforce. Sometimes I would uh, divest myself of one of my cav troops, sometimes even two. <laughs> I didn't like to do that, but uh, sometimes it was true, too. But in return, the infantry battalions would send me 
uh, one or two of their straight leg infantry uh, companies and uh, one or two of their mech infantry companies. I had a tank company from the division, almost always under my uh, command. And additionally, I had some of the 11th Cav Cav troops and, uh, and tank companies. So we were quite a divorce, uh, uh, d <laughs> divorce, diverse uh, unit. The main thing that I want you to understand is that it didn't matter that uh, a lot of these troops under my command were not on my organizational roster. They were all my guys when they were under my command. And I, I treated them uh, exactly the same as I treated my, my own CAV troops who were on the organizational roster. In fact, uh, my first killed in, killed in action was not a CAV trooper, but an infantry platoon leader. Okay, where were we in Vietnam? So we see figure one, please. Here's Zeon, which is where I was in uh, 1969, January. Tom and I were there, and the rest of these guys were there. Okay, we had the mission to be, uh, at that time we were doing a pacification mission in Zeon. It was on the northern outskirts of uh, Saigon. Here you can see Tansanu Air Airfield right there. Uh, here's Route 13 that went all the way from Saigon. It went up through Lai Tu, uh, Phu Kong, Van Cat, Lai K, uh, Lai K, which was our division headquarters, incidentally, and then all the way up uh, to, through Chanton, through An Lok, and all the way up to the Cambodian border, past Lok Ninh, about 12 miles. <coughs> so it was about 70 miles. This was the first infantry division's area of operations, and believe me, we uh, we went. Uh, as the task force quarter cab uh, through much of this. Uh, the uh, distance from uh, uh, Route 13 to the east was probably about 30 miles, and uh, Route 13 to the west uh, was about uh, 20 miles. Over here, War Zone D, an enormous jungle that went for about 50 miles, actually, in that direction. And over here, uh, War Zone C, a smaller War Zone, but still uh, very formidable. And here the Michelin Plantation, which we're going to come back to here very shortly. We were the uh, most powerful force in the division, of course, with all those armored vehicles. And I felt that we needed to be used against the enemy main force units that were up in the north. And so I suggested that more than once to the division, but it kind of fell on deaf ears. However, the enemy spring offensive on February 22nd uh, changed all that. They struck all over this area. It was uh, quite like uh, Tet of 68, about a year later. They struck all over this area, and so that changed things for us. The uh, Corps, our Corps found a buildup in the Michelin Plantation area, both in the plantation itself and in the jungle around it. So they devised a three division operation called Atlas Wedge. On the 16th of March, I got my mission. We were no longer a pacification force. Now we were told to attack west. Whoop, uh, can I, there you go. Attack west up here, uh, north of Lai K, going toward the Michelin Plantation up in here. And we're to, we were to take intermediate objectives along the way. Uh, the 7th NVA Division was supposed to be in there, and indeed they were there. Okay, now if you would turn it off, please. Here's an excerpt. In Xeon, late in the evening of 17th of March, I wrote in my journal, it will be difficult crashing through with tanks. Supposedly the 7th NVA Division and the 34th Artillery Group are in there. Today, as we flew low over the area, I could see some evidence of heavy traffic. It will be no picnic. I trust that I will bring out as many as I take in. Tragically, this was not to be, far from not to be. Well now, armor uh, prided itself on its ability to move, shoot, and communicate. But this jungle ahead of us was something else. And we had to do what we called jungle busting. We hated it. The enemy always had the advantage when we were jungle busting. Uh, we did not have the advantage. I'd like to have now figure six, please. You can get an idea of the problem <laughs> that we had. Here's uh, the, uh, 
this is a tank. I'm sorry it doesn't show quite as well as, uh, as one would hope, but this is a tank with the uh, tank crew on it. And here behind them are the infantry, barely being able to make their way. Normally, of course, the infantry went in front and they uh, found the enemy. And then the armor would, of course, then uh, uh, provide the punch attacking the enemy. But in this case, you could hardly get through the jungle unless you had a tank ahead of you. And so that's uh, what we faced. Well, uh, I was given the mission of taking certain objectives, and we took them on the way. We were four days in doing this and going through the jungle. And you know what? When we took those objectives, there was no enemy there. Surprise, surprise, they heard us coming. <laughs> okay. We sounded like a herd of elephants uh, trumpeting. As a matter of fact, probably a whole migration of elephants. So uh, put, please take that one off now. I figure it sets off, thanks. We got to the Michelin on the 22nd. The 11th Cav had been there before us, and they had driven out uh, much of the 209th Regiment of the 7th NDA Division. But the 11th Cav left on the 23rd, the very next day, leaving the Michelin responsibility all to us. Now, we found that in the plantations, we knew this before, we could move well down the lanes between the uh, rubber trees. Uh, and in the Michelin, it happened to be north-south direction. We could move well down those lanes. We could also move across the lanes if we knocked down a few trees, and we had to do that on several occasions. Uh, so we, uh, we uh, uh, were working the Michelin for those four days, and we had only light contacts, and that was with small caretaker units and recon units. But on the fourth day, we came into a heavily bunkered base camp. And this was an enormous base camp. It had enough bunkers in it for 1,500 men. And about in mid-afternoon of that fourth day, when we were blowing those bunkers and we were putting our tanks on top of them and uh, doing a neutral steer and crushing them, I received a new mission from the 1st Infantry Division. I was told to move the... Uh, uh, task force out of the Michelin plantation and move it down to fire support base dot. Now uh, that was a fire support base very hastily thrown up by the 11th Cav about a week before. And it was right at the eastern edge of the Michelin plantation. Why did, we, why did they want us to move out? Because they wanted to allow the Michelin plantation to fill back up with enemy and to attack again. And we were going to be the guys who were going to be attacking. I was told that when I, when I felt that the time was right, we were to attack and to destroy as much of the 7th uh, and the 8th Division as we possibly could. Okay, now we come to our enemy. At this point in the book, with fire support base dock, I pick up the enemy in great detail. When I was in the 11th Cav, I was extremely interested in our enemy. And I had time at that time to interrogate many of them, many of our prisoners. And uh, so I wanted to know who they were, where they had come from, how did they get where they were, how did they, where did they live, uh, what did they do, and so on and so forth. I wanted to know everything about the enemy that I possibly could. I had a lot of curiosity about that. Now, when I got to quarter cab, I didn't have much time because I was the commander. And when we, uh, when we uh, captured enemy, they were almost always wounded. So we had to uh, get what little information we could uh, right away and then get them uh, uh, back to the rear to be uh, treated medically. I did, however, have the 15,000 pages when I went to write this book that I told you about. And in those 15,000 pages, there were many intelligence and interrogation reports of the enemy, uh, some of them of the enemy that we actually captured. And I had also the help of Merrill Pribonel, who was a retired CIA officer, who is a retired CIA officer. Uh, he is fluent in all, f all uh, aspects of the Vietnamese language. In fact, he translated the official history, the enemy's official history of Vietnam called Victory in Vietnam. And he also translated uh, several enemy uh, unit histories, division histories. And I was especially interested, of course, in the seventh division history. Uh, in that history, I found the names of the units. Our own, our own records gave us certain names. I knew the, which uh, units I was fighting against, for example, in the Michelin, but I didn't know a lot about uh, what they had done and their responses to it. 
but uh, uh, so I knew which units are from the uh, seventh division history, and I knew the leaders by name. Now, when we went out to, out to fire support base dock on the night of the twenty uh, seventh and twenty eighth, we had an enormous attack against us. I knew it was coming. Uh, we were out there w way away from everybody, and it was the thirteenth day, and it was about time that uh, they did something, and they did. They hit us hard with a reinforced battalion. Uh, at this point, as I said, I bring in the enemy in detail and I interweave uh, who they were and what they did with our own actions and the results. Now, fire support base uh, was the largest battle to that point in, uh, in the core operation Atlas Wedge. Uh, we killed a lot of enemy that night and I had a uh, a young scout pilot in training, his first day at day, daybreak, Hugh Mills was out over that uh, battlefield and he reported that he had seen a lot of uh, uh, enemy, uh, bloody enemy drag tracks back into the jungle. I also lost six killed in action and I had 26 men uh, seriously wounded and dusted off and about three dozen were patched up and remained in the fight. Okay, that was the largest battle to date in Atlas Wedge but the biggest by far was yet to come. Now, based on the intelligence of the enemy and some intuition, I planned the attack into the Michelin for 30 March. On the night of 29 and 30 March, when we, were, when we knew that we were in for a big fight the next day, Tank Commander Mike O'Connor, a young sergeant, had no commo whatsoever working in his tank. Here's an excerpt of that situation. Mike could communicate with no one, not even on intercom, intercom. So by customary rules of operation, he should have deadlined the tank. That is, reported it unserviceable and unavailable for combat. But Mike did not want the platoon to go without him. So what did he do? He worked all night, uh, he and his crew, trying to get that com, uh, intercom uh, and the whole communication system working without success. Now, just try to imagine this. You're a tank commander of a 50-ton monster mounting a 90-millimeter tank gun with a 50-caliber machine gun in your turret and another 30-caliber ma machine gun in the tank, and you have no intercom, no way to communicate uh, outside the tank with your platoon leader. You can't even talk to your driver. But that's what Mike did. Mike O'Connor, please stand. Okay, so at daylight, we moved out. Please now show figure 18, our attack into the Michelin. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this. I'm just going to give you the highlights. We moved out of fire support base dock. Uh, we took part of the, of the uh, task force here. We turned west. We thought we were going to be able to use an armored, cavalry, uh, an, an armored vehicle launch bridge right here at this position over a significant stream. We'd been able only to get some air reconnaissance of it because, of course, we couldn't go up and do a reconnaissance because here's the enemy base camp. If we had tried to do that, they would know, know what was coming. So we, d we did not do that. But the air uh, reconnaissance said it looks like you can get that uh, uh, bridge uh, launched across there. We could not, and the story of why we could not is in the book, and I lost three men killed trying to get that bridgehead. We always had an, an, uh, an alternate plan for major operations, and our alternate plan was to, if we could not do that, which it turned out we could not, we dashed north uh, with a C troop and D company of the 11th Armored Cavalry. It was a tank company. And we dashed north, turned west, and right here there was a ford across that stream that we had actually used uh, when we were in, uh, I think it was the one, one that we used when we came out of the Michelin that night at dock. Uh, and we uh, put them there, and the fight began right there. C Company had to blast its way through uh, NVA. And uh, they went online out in here with a D, uh, D uh, Company, a C Troop, I should have said, D Company, here like this. And they started to move, and there were a lot of enemy. They, saw, they were reporting a lot of enemy starting to flee south. Uh, at this point, D Company gets hit right right here. They got hit with an RPG. One tank got uh, uh, hit, and it killed the driver and uh, weren't wounded the other two crew members. 
of figure 18 off now, please. I'd like to show you now figure 19. This is an extraordinary combat photo. I'm sorry that it doesn't come out better here, but what you have, this is the, a D Company 11th ACR tank. It's not the one that got hit. The one that got hit was off here to the left uh, of this one. <coughs> and the, the, the uh, person taking the uh, picture was on a, on a uh, tank here to the right, just slightly to the right rear. But you can see the tank commander here. And what I can see, but you probably can, is that there's a, uh, that there's a smoke. Uh, what's that from? That is from his 50 caliber machine gun. He is engaging the enemy at that moment, precise moment when the tank to the ne next to him gets hit with a man killed. And uh, how do I know that it's at that moment? Here are about three infantry troopers riding on the back. And uh, it is at the very moment of contact because in about one more second after this picture was taken, they're going to be off that tank in a hurry. They're not going to stay there because that tank turret is going to be swinging and they're going, and they're going to be firing. So that is an extraordinary picture, as I say, of a, of a combat. Unfortunately, D troop, uh, I'm sorry, D company stopped after they got hit. And the reasons are explained in the book. That, however, brought the C troop attack also to a halt because they could not allow the C troop to continue with that many enemy and have it having uh, not just one flank, its right flank open, but its left flank open also. So we had to stop for a while. I had to get the attack going again, though. So what I did was to bring. I probably should have left that up, but B Troop, I haven't mentioned them yet. They were on the right hand flank. They had not yet been committed. So I put I brought B Troop passing through the lines of D Company. And here is an excerpt <coughs> of B Troop. <coughs> At the center of B Troop's line was Master Sergeant Chuck McGrath's third platoon. To his left on line with him was Lieutenant Bob Klinkerman's second platoon. To McGrath's right was Lieutenant Jim Pitt's first platoon. During the pause in the fight with D Company stop and B Troop passing through them, the enemy <laughs> had moved in very close to the uh, line. Their tactic was called grab them by the belt. This is the from the enemy's point of view. Grab them by the belt and hold on. So they got in just as close as they could to the attacking unit. Why? Because there was that zone there where we could not bring in supporting fires. Uh, you couldn't bring them cl uh, so close to your friendly troops. So that was one of their tactics. And that's what they did. Now here is a brief excerpt from the enemy's point of view. The NVA soldier, Took, was afraid. He felt alone in, his, in this advanced position. When he lifted his head a little, he saw in the next lane to his right a 75 millimeter recoilless rifle team from his regiment. For many minutes, artillery and rockets from enemy gunships exploded to his rear. Well, this was Hugh Mills and the rest of the Air Cav troop at work. Here he, Hugh is now. This is his third day on the job. Pretty good on the job training. This is the biggest attack, <laughs> biggest battle in the, in the 1st Infantry Division uh, in that half of the year. <coughs> Hugh uh, told me. He said, I was scared, and I'll leave that blank. <laughs> he said, but fascinated when he went in over the ACABs. <laughs> He's getting pretty good training. OK, uh, to continue now with Took. Took's platoon leader had told everyone they must defend to the death. Took was afraid that up to this point, too many of them had done just that. The one consolation was the smoldering tank Took had earlier seen off to his right. The Americans had been hit and stopped. But now something was happening again. Took saw the recoilless men stiffen. He rose to a crouching position and looked north down the lane of trees. The enemy armor was coming again. A tank gun in a lane to his right fired, and he saw the underbrush in that lane torn away in a grotesque swath. Took looked at the recoilless men. The gunner was lying parallel to, parallel to his weapon, taking aim through a small break in the underbrush. The noise of the arm, oncoming armored vehicles and their firing was deafening. Just then, the recoilless gunner fired, and Took heard and saw the horrendous explosion and ball of fire as the round tore a huge hole in the front of an armored vehicle, lifting it and twisting it in its path. That was one of our B Troop 
vehicles. Here's an excerpt from Klinkerman's second platoon. Mike O'Connor had no commo, not even intercom. He said, I sent my loader down into the turret to tell my driver to turn, and no matter what, stay on line with the vehicles left, left and right, <coughs> which he did. I don't know how he did it, since it is difficult to see directly left and right without popping his head out. Magnificent work by that driver. Mike said, we went in firing. As we advanced, I used the main gun ma mainly to my front and left, since that is where I was getting incoming, and used the 50 while my loader was loading the main gun. He would slap my leg uh, when the gun was up, and I fired it, target or not. There was a group of three or four NVA slightly to my right who were popping up and launching RPGs. I took out one at a time, although it was hard to time them because I had several bunkers dead ahead of me. There was a second group launching RPGs in my direction from my left, but I could not see them. I could only see the rockets as they came by. Damn close, too. Scary as hell. And here's an excerpt from Jim Pitt's first platoon. Pitt said, we threw hand grenades into each bunker, then had a look inside. Nothing but signs of a hasty departure. We slowly moved deeper into the base camp. Then from a bunker about 20 meters to my front, an AK on full automatic emptied a 30-round ro magazine at us. My dismounted patrol hit the dirt as bullets struck all around them. <coughs> One sergeant went down clutching his shin and rolling over twice. Platoon Sergeant Leonard and I both thought he had taken a bullet. So did he. It turned out that it was a rock thrown by a bullet, and he was only bruised. Jim Pitts, platoon leader. Where are you, Jim? There you are. Jim Pitts. <laughs> Here's an excerpt from McGrath's third platoon. Platoon Sergeant Chuck McGrath's platoon was the hardest hit in the fuselage of RPGs. An RPG struck his tank, wounding him and killing the rest of his crew. Also killed in that salvo were an ACAV crew of three more of his men. That was the one that the uh, recoilless rifle hit. Then, and for several more hours, his arm and chest bandaged, he kept leading his remaining men. Later, he could not remember what happened. And when I talked to him years later, he still could not remember. Uh, for this action, he was awarded the Silver Star. A few years ago, retired Command Sergeant Major Chuck McGrath had his leg amputated at the hip from uh, the effects of the uh, toxins that we sucked in and he died a short time later. Well, this was the biggest battle ever in the Bloody Michelin. It went from sunup to sundown in that bunkered base camp. We had struck into elements of two regiments. We killed or captured a lot of enemy that day, but I also lost 12 men killed in action. Six of them were from that platoon in, uh, Major, in uh, Chuck McGrath's uh, platoon platoon in about 30 seconds. I had three dozen men dusted off and about the same number patched up. <coughs> Here are some excerpts. After the battle, we had, of course, to go on to other missions. And Jim Pitt said, looking back on the uh, Michelin situation, he said, we left the rubber plantation behind. Many of us also left behind our youth. I said, the spirit of Bravo Troop may be best summarized in an anecdote. Years later, the family of Jerry Driggers told me that they had not wanted him to enlist. Jerry, killed on McGrath's tank, had replied, if I don't go, I'll never feel right for the rest of my life. Those are the kind of men that I had. Well, we had four more big fights, big fights, one of them even bigger than this, the one that I just told you about and many, many uh, smaller ones before I turned over command of the task force. Uh, and there were two more uh, commanders during 1969 and early 1970. But then in early 1970, the 1st Infantry Division withdrew uh, from Vietnam. But task force quarter cab was the last one left in the field. Here's a situation from the stand down of task force quarter cab. Jay Ward, the new platoon leader of 3rd Platoon, that was Chuck McGrath's platoon of B Troop, told what the final days were like. Jay said, 
B Troop was the last combat unit to leave the field, and 3rd Platoon was the last in the march order when we closed C on. There was a big ceremony with a division band and a reviewing stand past which we road marched as we entered the base camp. Soldiers left in small batches, day by day, to other units or to go home. It was very sad to see one's outfit disintegrate one or two soldiers at a time, but that's the way it was. Soon it was my time to leave and say goodbye to the quarter cab. That was very hard. Jay Ward, please stand. <laughs> Our war was over, or so we thought. Well, I told you that I went back to, in 2005, made a trip back to Vietnam, and I went to the battlefields again, and I found my adopted family. I haven't told you about them, but it's in the book. And uh, I said a good final goodbye to them and to Vietnam, I thought. Uh, it was a very tough trip on me. It's hot over there, I discovered. I was old, I'd picked up a lot of those uh, diseases, and it was just very tough. And so I had determined that I couldn't come again. But in 2010, uh, late one night, I got a phone call from Mike O'Connor. Now, I knew that Mike had PTSD, and he asked me if I would go to Vietnam with him. And I astonished myself by saying yes. Yeah. And so Mike and Dr. Mark Kane, who was Mike's clinical psychologist, and I went back to the Michelin. Dr. Mark Kane, please stand. Now, Mark needed Mike uh, to get to talk about it. I knew that approach because my clinical psychologist some years before that had said the same thing. He told me that I needed to write about it. Well, I did, and this is one of the uh, results. Uh, and it helped uh, enormously, and I knew that uh, Mike going back would, uh, would help him. Here's an excerpt. On the 30th of March, 2010, we, stopped in, we stood in the Michelin where exactly 41 years earlier to the day and hour, Mike had been in the thick of the fight. Mark was questioning Mike, bringing long suppressed images to the surface. Mark, is this the spot where you were when your buddy Benny Diaz was killed? Mike, yes. Mark, did you see the RPGs hit his A cab? Mike. Yes, but I did not know it was his ACAB at the time. I was receiving RPGs and engaging an NDA in a tree. I found out in a few minutes we had some KIAs, but didn't know until later that Benny was one of them. Well, the three of us then walked to a nearby dry cistern in the rubber. Uh, please show figure 38. <coughs> and we had a small ceremony in the Michelin. Here's an excerpt. I had lost 12 men from different units in that day of vicious battle, the most in one day of my entire tour. Now I read six of their names while Mike lit a stick of incense for each man and laid it on the edge of the cistern. I dropped the sticks into the cistern. Then Mike slowly read the names of six B troopers among the 12 while I lit a stick for each. Mike then carefully picked up the remaining sticks one by one repeated the name of the trooper, and as he dropped each in the well, said, rest in peace. He retained the burning stick for Benny Diaz until last, holding it to his chest, tears welling in his eyes, and finally said, my young friend Benito Diaz, rest in peace, and dropped the stick. Then Mike slowly and quietly sang a song of tribute he had composed for those men. He called it the Hotel Michelin. Show figure 39, please. Mike's tribute. Here's the excerpt. He was blinking back tears and vaguely gazing across four decades on this spot where his life had suddenly changed so many years ago. He kept singing more softly now and finally came to the end. Last thing I remember, I was running for Lyke. I had to find that freedom bird, but the mines were in my way. Relax, said Driggers. Diaz will show you the way. Come back any time you want, but you can never stay. 
figure 39 off, please. Now, I have some other task force soldiers present. So those others uh, that I have not mentioned in the book, uh, as I uh, select those excerpts, please stand as I call your name, Terry Valentine. <laughs> Joe West. <laughs> David Goodell. Where is David? Oh, there he is, right here. Mike Baldwin. Mike over there. <laughs> Cliff Kilburn. <laughs> Richie Green. <laughs> Willie Seibert. <laughs> Roger Flanagan. <laughs> there, he is. there he is, Roger. Thank you, Roger. Have I missed any task force soldier who may have been, uh, come in uh, late that I should introduce right now? Well, my profound thanks to all you guys. And this now is the time for questions. So I would ask you guys, those of you who can, to come up front with me. Please address your questions to me or to any one of these fellows. Or, or you ask the question of me, and I will, if I feel one of them can answer it better than I can, I will direct it to that person. So those of you who can stand up and come up, would you please uh, do that? And, and while you're doing that, Bill, if you're going to ask a question, please wait till JD or I give you the mic okay. uh, because we're recording the, all of this and it'll be on our YouTube site uh, a little later. guys thank you very much all right now this I hope is going to be the most interesting part of the whole thing usually the question and answer is so please your questions yes yes sir yeah okay wait for the mic right there please yes yeah, please I know a trooper that was in the 101st Airborne mm -hmm. and they were through the Michelin area I think it was in 65 yes. or 66 correct yes. Uh, I don't know specifically about that particular unit, in the, but let me say that a good many units were. Uh, what I did say was that we fought the largest battle that was ever fought, in the, to, to include for the French. The French were in there. Uh, I've written another book. It's on the full into China wars, and I, I cover some of that about the Michelin in, in, in that particular book. Uh, but uh, yes, there were many battles in there. I don't know the details of many of them. There were a few battles that came after that, but not nothing near, nearly as big right. as the one that, well, he that made, we fought. He made two claims. He said the French were in, in cahoots with the Viet Cong, <clears throat> and that uh, any damage to the rubber trees, uh, the French sent a bill to MACV and expected payment yeah. for damage to the trees. Is that and correct? Thank you for that uh, information, but it is not correct. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. <laughs> I, I, I hate to disagree with a fellow veteran, but, but it is not correct. The French indeed did keep the rubber plantations, and what they had to do, uh, and if you read my next book, which will be coming out in a couple of years, I hope, uh, but, <laughs> uh, but uh, the French had to pay the, the Viet Cong not to kill them. Uh, they, they kept the, the rubber plantations were the second most important uh, product. Uh, they produced the second most important product after only rice. And so for the economy of the South Vietnam, they had to be kept going. And so the French, were, of course, were the ones who, who had to do it. It was terrible out there. If you can imagine being a, a French rubber plantation manager in a, in a house out in the middle with Viet Cong all around you and, uh, telling and, and threatening. Some of them had their families there threatening them. You must pay. Uh, uh, and so they paid. They, ab they absolutely did pay. No question about that. And it did uh, cause some hard feelings for the French, but I think when you understand the full story, you won't have those feelings anymore. And the question of the rubber trees, yes, the, the uh, owners were compensated uh, for some of the rubber. Boy, they had a lot of compensation coming after us because we put in the, the I, I didn't tell you about the airstrikes, but we had over 20 tons of bombs and, and napalm put in. Those rubber trees were weeping, the, the white uh, uh, latex went down, they, they were crying as much as, as some of us were when we thought about it. it. It was awful. It was just absolutely terrible. Why, why in the world 
would human beings do this to one another? I still haven't figured that one out. But at any rate, yes, they were compensated. Okay, very good question. Thank you. Yes, please. So given that you were uh, fighting in uh, jungle terrain, uh, how effective were the um, heavy military vehicles? Uh, as I said, when we had to do jungle busting, not as effective as one might think. Uh, we simply could not move. We could shoot fine. I mean, we could shoot anywhere, but we could not move. And without movement, armor simply is not effective. And the enemy always had the advantage. And yet General Westmoreland, when he went over, he was... He, he wanted to do search and destroy all the time. What happened with that was that we went into the jungles after the enemy. They loved it because uh, they had the advantage and uh, we did not have the advantage. It was a terrible tactic, just terrible. And unfortunately, General Abrams did not uh, change that much. He said that he did, but he did not. Uh, when in 1969, after General Abrams took over, we were still doing search and destroy. That's what the Michelin, that's what this battle was like. And that's what were some, some of the other ones that I didn't tell you about uh, were like. Uh, so they had the advantage. Uh, we did not have the advantage. We did the best we could. We, we uh, conducted our missions as well as we could, but it was not a pleasant time. Would anybody disagree with me on that? No. <laughs> okay, I didn't think they would. Yes, Jim. No, I'm not disagreeing with you, but the, the other side of that is we actually preferred the jungle busting, even though every, the way Bill described it's accurate, because it was usually somebody pretty close to stars on the collar up there in a helicopter that would have wanted to run a trail that no one had been on in 10 <laughs> years, or to follow a, a logging road through, and those were always mine. Yeah. Always. Yeah. And yet we'd be ordered to run them to kill our yeah. trees down. And the, same, and the same thing applies to the clearings. There were always a few clearings uh, everywhere in the jungle. Don't go across the clearings. because That's a very bad place to go because you're going to be greeted with RPGs if, if you go across, or mines, or sometimes both. Uh, yes, comment. Uh, here. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the other problems we had in the jungle was that you had all these termite mounds. <laughs> termite mounds would be like 10 foot tall, 15 foot across at the base, and they were like concrete. And so you'd be, you, if uh, being a tanker, I was a driver, and you'd drive, you'd be busting in double column into the jungle, and you'd run across one of these. You're trying to keep a straight line getting through there so you knew where you was at, because it's just, you know, military tactics to go where you're supposed to go, not where you don't know where you're at. And once you start moving around in different angles for any time in the jungle, you get lost. You're not nowhere where you thought you were. And we'd hit those termite mounds, and they would flat stop us. We'd have to back up. We'd have to go around them. And then by the time you got on the other side of them, you, you might or might not be on the right track. And try to read a compass on a tank. It's metal. Yeah. And, and, now, and now, try, now tell them about your friendly red ants. Well, <laughs> tell them about I've, uh, I've got one of the best stories uh, doing this bus busting jungle. We were busting, and I was the lead tank. Uh, of Alpha Troop, and uh, we were sec I was in Second Platoon, and we were busting to get to a village seal that we that uh, is in the book I think as well. And as we got, there was this huge red tree out in front of me. I mean, I, it didn't dawn on me that there was anything wrong with it, <laughs> uh, but I I figured it was a straight line, and like I said, you want to go as straight as much as you can so you don't get off course. I hit that tree, and there was this honeycomb nests of mud and red ants that came down and I don't know if you ever heard of cooties when you was a kid you played yeah. with cooties and they had the double jointed legs well these things had double jointed legs they had a stinger and they had pinchers mm -hmm. and they'd spin a web well these things we called them nine steppers when they bit you you spray them with insecticide and they'd still move and bite nine more times or nine <laughs> seconds more so nine steppers it gets you every, every time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I was, I was in Vietnam from 768, and your question about the Michelin rubber thing. Here, just a minute. We were in and out of that the whole time. Okay. Their, their objective was to go in and search and destroy and kill as many as you can and then pull out and let them come back in. We were in the Iron Triangle the same way, the Michelin rubber the same way. We were in there four or five different times. And every time you went in there, there was a battalion of 
Just our Vietnamese regulars in there waiting for him. They, they love, yeah. They love the plantation. We love them too because in the plantations, it was probably only 98 degrees where it was a heck of a lot uh, uh, <laughs> higher than that outside. Uh, so uh, there Sir? were streams there. Uh, this is a bit of a follow-up to the previous question. Uh, I believe I saw M48 tanks uh, in your pictures. and you uh, and, and And from my reading, uh, my understanding is that the 11th Cav had at least some, if not all, 551 Sheridans. Yes, they did. I'd like to... In, if you had your way, looking back, what would you change in terms of equipment, organization, and mission to be more effective? Uh, the, the mission, I would certainly change. No more jungle busting, that for sure. Okay. In terms of equipment, not much of anything. The M48 tank was marvelous, marvelously suited for this job. Now, that was not the newest tank in the inventory. But you know what? Vietnam was not the primary threat to the United States at that time. We had a Cold War going on. We had uh, the Russians on one side of the uh, Iron Curtain, and we were trying to defend against them. So the new tanks, the M60s, which I had, uh, one time I had half M48s and half M60s, uh, the new tanks went to Europe uh, uh, because they were needed uh, much more over there. They, they were heavier gunned than, than the 90 millimeters. But so far as what we needed for a, t a tank in Vietnam, you couldn't have asked for anything better than the M48 we had. And it was powered by diesel, not the gasoline that when I was a tank platoon leader in Germany, not the gasoline where we had to refill all the time, uh, the but diesel. The M48 yeah. Much better for landmines than it was for the Jeep. Yeah. For the other vehicles on the yeah. Road. Yeah, absolutely. When when an ACAV hit a hit a mine, that was bad news. But when a tank hit a hit a mine. Uh, yeah. It could be bad news, but it usually it was just a jar and knocked off a road, road wheel or two. That was about it. Very good. Uh, other okay. questions, please. Talk a little bit about keeping the M48 up um, in the jungle and in the rain and in the, in the heat and the like. Uh, I know you had some problems with your intercom, but talk a, talk a little bit about just keeping it up generally. Yeah. Well, these guys can tell you about the bruised knuckles. <laughs> that uh, One of the things that we did was to throw tracks because we were hitting up against trees and we were, we were going over a very difficult terrain and uh, the, the tracks would come off the sprockets. And so when you threw track, what that meant was that you had a knuck knuckle-busting, cursing job for probably at least two hours uh, in the middle of the jungle trying to get that track forced back into position. Uh, there's, story, there's a story specifically of Mike uh, and, and his tank in, in the book uh, about that very experience. Okay, so we one have that. Things, uh, uh, we had through a track in the jungle one time, and I don't know who this lieutenant was, came over to us. He was, I believe he was from 11th Day of the Ark. Anyway, uh, he come over and showed us how to pop that track back on without taking it apart. Now, normally we had to undo everything, take it all apart, wrench it back on there and put it all back together. It's a really long, hard job. In the meantime, you're vulnerable to being attacked. But he showed us how to take a piece of track box, throw it in the sprocket, drive, pop it right back on, and go. And it worked really good for our worn out pieces of track we had. Yeah. Now, if you had new track, it probably didn't work that good. You had to do a lot more work. But uh, that saved our butt a lot of times. Did I hear you right that this was a lieutenant? I think it was. A wow. Lieutenant. Can I believe that? Wasn't this one? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, we, we had terrific lieutenants. The only reason that I, uh, but we also had some terrific sergeants. The only reason that Sergeant McGrath was a platoon leader, he was actually the platoon sergeant, but he was the platoon leader. I kept him in that position because he was fantastic. And uh, I just wasn't going to spoil it by putting a brand new a second lieutenant in that position. So I was very selfish. I kept McGrath in that position. Yes. yes. One thing specifically to your question, the jungle busting was terror on the final drives of the M48. I can't begin to tell you how many new final drives we had to put on, but it, for any other armored outfit anywhere else in the world, it would have been a, a horrible rate of replacement. Tanks were never designed to be bulldozers, and the final drives are what always gave out. I was with the 1st Division, 1st uh, Battalion, 26th Infantry, I was yeah. a combat yeah. medic. 
and we worked with the calf for a month, and uh, we were never so happy to get away from the calf. <laughs> that's all he did is break down. And we had <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> that, was, that was jungle bus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, <laughs> Richie. <laughs> Uh, two little comments. Uh, one, we lost end connector bolts, which the end connectors are what holds the track blocks together. And one day I was sitting on the top of the tank reading PM Magazine. It's preventive maintenance. I think everybody has seen it. Nobody ever bothered to read it. <laughs> on the back cover, they were showing some liquid that they were using on helicopters to hold bolts in place. I ordered two boxes of it. We'd go through four or five end connectors a day. This liquid in a little bottle is what now is known as Loctite. <laughs> we, I, I took my crew, I was TCing 2-5 because the platoon sergeant took over as platoon leader. We pulled off all the bolts, one block at a time, put the Loctite on, we didn't lose an end connector <laughs> for almost a week and a half. And then it was only one at a time instead of a half a dozen a day. The bolts we'd lose, the wedges and the wedge bolt. This is just one example of many, many of the uh, intuitive things that these guys, they, they devised things that were, uh, that boggle my mind. Yeah. And so that's just one of the many, okay. Other questions, yes? How did you do for fuel and parts and that kind of thing? When you're in a forest, how do you handle that? Okay, very good question. Excellent, because the logistics was a, an, indeed a big problem. But you know what? In Vietnam, uh, we were lucky. We had the helicopter that the, no previous war had in, in that quantity. And we had helicopters. We had the super hook that would lift up a whole uh, ACAV. The whole thing would come up. Y usually, you had to take the, uh, uh, as I recall, you had to take the engine off, but the, but the rest of it would go up. And so we had the helicopters, and those guys were marvelous. Uh, they would lower their uh, loads of uh, supplies, parts, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, fuel. fuel, yeah, absolutely, fuel bladders and so on, for, so forth. Water, ev everything that we needed, and uh, they would lower it to us, drop it down when when they couldn't land. And so they did a, an absolutely marvelous job. But you're absolutely right. Logistics was very important. The uh, diesel engine, though, solved so many problems that we had. In, in Europe, we, in, in back when I was a lieutenant, we had enormous problems having gasoline engines. But the diesel engine, you could go four and five times as far. Uh, we hard, I don't remember ever a time that we had any problem with getting fuel. No. Yeah. It, was, yeah. it was said almost came out religiously with the supply. Yeah. Very good air. question. Very good. Other questions? Yes, please. Here. I was in the artillery, and I didn't I wondered if you had any artillery support. I don't think it's good for trees, but uh -huh. I just wondered. Yeah, we absolutely did have artillery support. As a matter of fact, a fire support base dock, uh, the uh, D of the first of the fifth artillery uh, uh, battery, uh, first of the fifth battalion. D battery was in there with us, and we had two tubes of the bigger stuff from uh, uh, eighth of the sixth uh, with us. And uh, believe me, when we were we were attacked that night, uh, the uh, artillery commander in there lowered those tubes because you can't shoot the artillery from the fire support base that's being attacked <laughs> because you'd be shooting it straight up, you know, and down. You don't you don't do this. You get your fire support, as you well know, from another fire support base. We always in the first division. You all, they, they never conducted an operation which could not be car covered by what they called the fan, the artillery fan. And so uh, we always had artillery support, and it was fantastic. Then when uh, one, of the, one of the big missions that we had that I did not mention was road uh, security, that whole road, uh, Highway 13, going up to Cambodia. We had the northern portion of that. We had uh, three fire support bases up there. These were permanent bases. Fire support bases, uh, uh, Thunder One, Two, and Three, and uh, I was c I commanded whenever there was any uh, attack, and we had several incidents of attacks, uh, so I commanded the whole schmear uh, on those 
uh, occasions. But otherwise, they were just supporting the division wherever the fire support was needed. I'm not sure that I fully answered your question. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, they, they were of two sizes. They were the 105s and the 155s. Now, if we really had uh, a ne necessity, we also got 175 howitzers that they could shoot for uh, 25 miles. And the 8-inch were the most, uh, the most uh, useful because they were so accurate, except when they fired over our... Uh, I was in Lycay for a very short time in the 11th cab, and uh, it just so happened that our talk was directly... Uh, directly under the uh, outgoing eight inchers and believe me when they fired they would raise you up out of your bunk if you're in at night yes uh question is did we have flechettes we absolutely did yes we had them in the tank and we uh we also had artillery uh artillery I'm and, and the helicopter. yeah uh, yeah and, and in the helicopters, as, as Hugh says. And we also had canister. We used a lot of canister, especially in the jungle. They would, they would fire that 90 millimeter. Sometimes that's the only thing that would allow, allow the tank to go forward into some of that place. It would blast everything away. And when it went down in the Michelin, it took down a lot of trees. As I said, they shivered as if in terror. Canister, yeah. for those who don't know, is a large shotgun shell. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, the round itself is probably that tall. And the end of it is probably that big, and that big round is full of just metal. Yeah. Just yeah. Bearings, yeah. 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 And then, then describe flechette too, so and people understand. Are dark. The same idea, but they're dark. Yeah, they look like little arrows. Yeah, they thousands of them. Beehives, they were called. Beehive rounds. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Other questions. Yes. What uh, were your rules of engagement? How often did they change during a uh, operation, and how confusing was it to you when they did get changed? Not at all. It was uh, the rules of engagement. We did have rules of engagement. Uh, primarily, however, where we were operating, it was in what was called a free fire zone. Well, why was it a free fire zone? Because there weren't any uh, hamlets uh, there. It was strictly jungle and wasteland. And so uh, that at, in, in zones like that, you could actually engage anywhere at any time. The, the, air, uh, the uh, air cab could come in and fire. Now, what you did have to do, of course, was to be sure that the friendly units on the ground uh, notified. They, they had to know where they were in notifying head, headquarters, uh, higher headquarters, where they were. Because otherwise, it is a free fire zone, and you could come in and, uh, and fire. And unfortunately, sometimes uh, the air cab, not, not my guys, but uh, some of the other air cabs, they came awfully close. As a matter of fact, that, uh, that D company uh, that uh, was with us, uh, the tank company in the Michelin, they got fired on by the air cab the, the night uh, before we moved out. Yeah. Yeah, it was the first of the ninth. It was not the, not the D, D troop air. <laughs> Never. <laughs> sure, by all means, Hugh. The, uh, the air cab guys uh, in the scouts especially operated right on the treetop, and we were out ahead of these guys about 100 yards. And what often run into unidentified personnel on the ground, and, and in my experience, we were no further away than you and I are. Uh, enemy forces would not look at you. They wouldn't make eye contact. Uh, they would avert the eyes. Uh, a friendly farmer or a South Vietnamese soldier would look at you, he'd smile. Uh, I, I, I'm sure thinking, I'm a good guy, don't shoot me. But enemy would not make eye contact. So if you had guys in that condition, we'd fire. Uh, our call sign was dark horse. Uh, and we had what we call dark horse rules of engagement. No women, no children. Um, uh, have a direct target before you shoot. But we were right in front of these guys 100 yards and when they opened up about 20 percent of what they shot ricocheted up yeah. into us so as they began a, a frontal engagement we'd pull back over the top of them so that if we went down we went down behind them not in front of them very good thanks thanks you yes well we've had uh 
an army since Vietnam that's been all volunteer. So Vietnam's our last army with draftees. 1973. Could, could you talk, speak to the, dra yes, the role of the draftees in Vietnam? Uh, the role of the draftees in Vietnam uh, was the same as it was in, in uh, the previous wars, magnificent. They were, they were great. Uh, I remember, especially in Germany, when, as I said, when I was a lieutenant, uh, we had uh, draftees, and what was so wonderful about them was uh, one thing. Uh, we had such a range of experience. You had some who were college graduates. You had some who were still in high school. You had, the, you had that whole range. You had uh, people who were, uh, had uh, very useful skills. Uh, they had not enlisted. They were citizen soldiers. And they were great I, I, uh, in Vietnam. I, I don't know which ones were uh, enlisted and which ones. Well, I, I read you about one, Jerry Driggers, who enlisted. Uh, Jerry Driggers, incidentally, won the Silver Star about three weeks before he was killed. Wonderful, wonderful. I, Should yeah. we go back? Should we go back? Yes. Absolutely yes. There's no question in my mind. Let me just go to the Iraq uh, war. In my estimation, that was a terrible, terrible decision. Uh, it was politically charged, but it was a terrible decision in this regard, not having anything to do with politics. If we had had a, vol uh, if we had had a, a, a just, justly administered draft, which we did not have, but it could be done. If we had a justly administered draft where everybody was, uh, was uh, perhaps going to be called. You have a citizen soldier then who have mothers, fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers. You have a whole nation that is involved when you have a citizen soldiery fighting your wars. When you have entirely volunteers, I hate this word, uh, the, uh, the paid soldier. Mercenary. Yeah, mercenary. I, I hate that word because the, these volunteers are, are from what I have heard, they are wonderful soldiers, but it's not doing the country, I think, as much good as it could be if we had a, a verifiable, justified uh, draft situation. We wouldn't be uh, so willing to go into wars that are not advisable if the whole country has a chance to discuss this, this type of thing ahead of time. So I think that we need uh, some kind of universal service, uh, men and women, and uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily military service, but some kind of uh, some kind of service. Much of it could perhaps be done within our country. You know, we have first responders, we have the medics, we have the fire uh, fighters, we have the police. All, all of them, I would think, would be wonderful places for young people to get uh, some training in a in a truly uh, uh, justified and justifiable draft situation. That's just my opinion. I'm sure, I'm sure that there are other people who have different opinions. Uh, when you went back to Vietnam in more recent years, yes. how did you find the country and the people compared to what you expected and compared to what you found 30, 40 years ago? Wonderful question, and, and Mike and Mark can, can also attest to this. In the first place, the Vietnam are a very proud people. They have a 2,000-year history of fighting against foreign domination. Uh, they thought the, the Chinese had dominated them for a thousand of those years at various times. And then the French for 150 years. And, uh, and so they, they had uh, the idea that they wanted, they wanted their independence and they wanted the unity of the country. When they talked about, Viet talked about Vietnam, they were talking about the whole Vietnam, not a North-South Vietnam and a South Vietnam. Uh, so that was, that was uh, th they had been brought, the children were brought up on stories of the heroes. And so they had that kind of a desire. They are a wonderful, wonderful, independent people, so hardworking. I could tell you stories about a sweetheart. I love her dearly, 32-year-old mother of two children. She and I email one another. She speaks and writes very good English. And she is going through a terrible time. Their, their employment situation right now in Vietnam is, is awful. And she's going through a terrible, terrible time because of that. Okay, but when we went back, I was surprised. These people received us. They were genuinely friendly. Now, in, in 2005, 
uh, there had been many, many uh, American soldiers who had gone back before that, and I knew that they had gotten good receptions, but I wasn't absolutely sure. But we got a wonderful reception uh, from them. Uh, the, in the book, I think, I think it's in this book. <coughs> if not in there, it's in my previous book. Uh, in the Michelin Plantation, when, when I went back in 2005, you'll see a, a picture of a gentleman who was about five years older than I. Uh, he was one of our enemy. Uh, he was a Viet Cong, and I, I met him right at the corner of what had been our fire support base dock at, at, at the time when we were there in 1969. It was wasteland. There was nothing there. And now there was a hamlet there. There was a corner drugstore, uh, a, a corner a, a pub, that kind of thing, right, right about at dock. And we have our, you, you'd see it in the book, we have our arms around one another. We joked with one another. Well, well first of all, he, he said that, uh, there was a, a young, a younger lady there too. She said that she she was Viet Cong, and her job was to count the uh, numbers of the American uh, vehicles that went past her her intersection. And so she did that religiously. And she said to, to me through through our interpreters, of course, she said we knew everything you were doing. And the old gentleman said, yes, but we couldn't do a damn thing about it. <laughs> <laughs> And and uh, so when I went back in 2010, unfortunately, I found that he had died just two years before that. But we were received extremely well. Uh, Mark and Mike, what would you say to add yeah, to that? I, I, I was surprised that the economy was doing a little bit much better. Yeah. I was surprised that the economy was booming uh, as well as it was. There was new construction everywhere, very good roads. Uh, it, we went to uh, the Thunder fire bases, and where we had our little outposts there, they were had concrete roads put in there, brand new houses going in, uh, new buildings for plants going in, uh, where people were going to work. And this was all the way up and down this desolate, what used to be desolate highway. But I was just blown away by uh, what was happening there. They, they, it seemed to be working good. Uh, Mark, did, did you want to add to that? We were um, there over Easter Sunday, and uh, Mike uh, uh, and I uh, went with uh, Bill and uh, sat through a wonderful uh, Catholic uh, ceremony. Mm -hmm. uh, the nuns were as uh, active as the priests, and uh, I videotaped uh, the worship service, and at the end of the service, the choir stood and flashed us a big smile and peace signs to the three of us. We mm -hmm. stuck, out, stuck out like a mm -hmm. sore thumb. <laughs> And then uh, we went over to the Black Virgin Mountain, uh, and uh, it's a wall. It's a, it's, a, it's a Disneyland uh, tourist area now. They have a uh, uh, a ski lift going up halfway up the Black Virgin Mountain up to uh, Sum, uh, m monasteries up there, and on top you still have the the remnants of the uh, specialist force on top of the mountain. But uh, we're uh, riding together, Mike and I, and uh, uh, we're. There's only one other person of uh, Caucasian uh, with his uh, Vietnamese wife and uh, biracial son. Uh, and I got 10 hours of video of people smiling and laughing and making faces at us. And uh, we were a, a part of their tourism industry. It was amazing. Uh, and I might add, too, that about less than, less than one mile from where Mike and B Troop were, were in that fierce battle, when I went back in 2010, less than one mile away, in the middle of the Michelin plantation was a brand new, at least two story, maybe three story, I don't remember, school, with the kids coming and going uh, to school. Uh, it, and it's where we got rid of a lot of our, uh, uh, we had brought uh, over se about 75 pounds worth of costume jewelry that uh, the kids loved it, and so we got rid of a little bit. But it's a brand new school out there in the middle of what had been a fierce battlefield. By, by all means, you. Since Sandra's here, I want to give you just an impression of the day that I met Colonel Haponsky for the first time. I came to Vietnam in January of 69 as a brand new pilot right out of flight school. I was 20 years old. I'd been a first lieutenant for about 33 days. And I was learning, I, I spent the first two months flying Hueys. Um, 
and one of those missions was to fly to Zeon and pick up the squadron commander and serve as his command and control aircraft one day. And I was with a fairly senior warrant officer uh, named Barney Jones. And as we landed, a Jeep came flying up and the Colonel was in it and he bounced out and headed toward the aircraft and the, and the warrant in the other seat, we're running at flight idle, hits the private button on the intercom and he said, this is not gonna be good. I said, what's the matter? And he said, he's wearing a helmet. <laughs> he's carrying a rifle and he's wearing web gear. All the other guys we flew were soft hats and we flew them around at 1500 feet. He said, this guy's gonna wanna go on the ground. And he did all day. Every place we went, put me down here, I'm gonna visit B Troop. Put me down here, I'm gonna visit A Troop. Put me down here, it's a pacification mission on the road. He ran around the jungle uh, far more than two pilots really appreciated because we're sitting out there on the road waiting on him with absolutely no cover other than those who were with him. But Bill Haponsky was the epitome of an aggressive cavalry commander and I retired as a cavalry squadron commander and this is the guy that taught me what the word audacious means. Wow. Wow. Thank you very much. Wow. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah, I did a lot of writing. Yes, yeah. Richie. Okay, here we go. You were wondering about their economy. Uh, four months ago, before I took a two-month trip out in the southwest to see a friend of mine here who shot me with an M79 grenade launcher, <laughs> uh, I bought two pair of extremely high-priced running shoes at REI, Asics, and Ciccone, went over to Macy's in Oak Brook, and bought two pair of Levi's. The Levi's in both pair of my running shoes made in Vietnam. Yeah, oh, very good. Yes. This is not on the economy, but uh, since Hugh mentioned Sandra, I want to tell you what a wonderful lady she is. <laughs> I've been coming down to their house uh, about once a year, and with me I was bringing strangers. Uh, some of them just my friends. <laughs> uh, some relatives of mine, uh, people that Bill and Sandra did not know, but took my word that they were good people and it was okay to let them in their house. <laughs> and they took us in, uh, treated us like royalty, went out to lunch every time, uh, wouldn't let me buy a thing. <laughs> uh, and, and just uh, one of the most gracious ladies I've ever met in my life. So thank you, Sandra. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he did, and at this at, at this point, we're going to throw in the towel. Uh, Bill is going to sign uh, books out in the uh, out in the lobby uh, when we're done here. But before these guys get off the stage, uh, let's give all these quarter cab guys a round of applause for their service. Okay, I'm going to ask everybody but Bill to go ahead and resume your seats. Thanks, fellas. Uh, just an extraordinary. I think this is the largest group of quarter cab Vietnam vets we've ever had at Cantini. So. Oh yeah. Please tell them that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you may wonder why I pushed this book. Bill said several times during his talk, if you want to know more about that, you got to read the book. Uh, I've read the book not once, but about seven times. And I, I can tell you, this is a terrific book. If you want to, I, I just commend it to you. Uh, but the other reason I push it is because Bill has very graciously uh, uh, agreed that uh, any proceeds from the sale of the books will go to the museum. 
So um, we really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, before we formally um, uh, thank Bill for his presentation. Just a couple of very, very quick notes. One is this has been video recorded, as you can tell. Uh, the First Division Museum has a an account on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and you uh, search First Division Museum, you'll see all of our presentations, including this one, uh, that will uh, that will be there. Uh, our next presentation is on September uh, 3rd. I'm sorry, I was about to say 6th. Uh, it's advertised here. Uh, you, as many of you may know, the third Friday in September is National Prisoner of War Missing in Action uh, uh, Day. Uh, we always observe that here in Cantini. And in honor of that, uh, we're bringing three First Division veterans here who were prisoners of war. Uh, they were captured by the Serbs in Macedonia. Uh, in the 1990s when we were conducting peace operations there, very brutally treated for about 30 days until the Reverend Jesse Jackson uh, went to Serbia. Some of you may remember, uh, did an unauthorized negotiation uh, with Slobodan Milosevic, but was able to achieve uh, their freedom. All three of those guys, two of them for sure, we're working on the third one, but all three of them will be here on September uh, 3rd to tell their story, and I think it's an important story. Uh, the other thing is we do these programs uh, free of charge, as you know. Uh, but if you stop by the uh, veteran welcome table out in the lobby, you'll find a red, white, and blue uh, mailbox. That, uh, that table is staffed by uh, veterans who belong to Cantini Post 556 of the American Legion, including First Division uh, veterans. And uh, if you drop your spare change in that mailbox, we'll see that it goes to the Midwest Shelter for Homeless Veterans in Wheaton which is a fantastic grassroots 501c3 organization that is doing really good work for a problem that ought not to exist in the United States, and that is that many of our honorably discharged veterans do not have a place to call home. Uh, okay, so on all of that note, I don't want, uh, Bill, fa fantastic book and fantastic presentation, and thank you to your supporting cast of thousands and Sandra, uh, all of you quarter gav guys, there's nobody more welcome here uh, than a First Division veteran, and you're particularly welcome here tonight. Uh, we're cheap, uh, despite despite Colonel, the Colonel's generosity, okay? We pour all that into the mission. We don't do anything extravagant with it. So we have these very, very humble uh, thank you gifts. Bill, come on up here. Uh, and your thank you gift is this uh, environmentally correct water bottle, okay? <laughs> It's got the museum logo on it, and it can be distinguished from any others you may have been given because this one is the big. Okay, we're going to hustle him out to the lobby, and if you want to ask more questions, do them while you're purchasing a book. <laughs> and uh, and I'm sure all of these wonderful quarter cab veterans will be able to. Uh, to answer your questions as well while they stay here. Thank you for coming, and I hope we see you at Cantini again soon.